Welcome to TFL Talking Trucks. This is episode 12, and I'm Andre Smirnov with the Fast Lane Truck, and today we have a very special show. Why is that, Roman? Because we've got a guy that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, hey, Jonathan, thank you for coming on the show. That is, of course, Jonathan Ward, uh, the uh, lead designer and, I guess, CEO of uh, Icon 4x4 Off-Road. Uh, and I would say you need no introduction, but I just introduced you. If you guys are into uh, cars and trucks, then uh, Jonathan is one of the designers and one of the um, people in the industry who has uh, brought retro back, who has made old school cool, who has uh, left uh, an indelible impression on uh, the off-road vehicles that we're driving. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to uh, be on our show, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, it's a pleasure. I actually so, got to sneak out of work early today because of this. <laughs> Thank you for joining TFL Talking Trucks podcast. If you love pickup trucks or big full-size SUVs, if you love trailering, towing, and going off-road, this is the right place to be. Together, we can make this podcast the most popular ever. So before we get into... Uh, some very specific questions that, that I certainly have for you. Tell me about how you got uh, started and how you became uh, the lead designer of uh, your company. Well, fortunately, uh, to be an industrial designer, it's not legally required that you actually have any specific training or degrees. In fact, one of my design heroes, Raymond Lowy, totally made up the term and put it on his business card and partied on. So. I'm just another guy who's always loved vintage transportation, um, extensive world travelers, so a lot of overland and safari and stuff like that. So very quickly had a deep appreciation for the vintage Toyota Land Cruisers. And I hated my real job. So I talked my wife into quitting her responsible job as well. And this was always a hobby passion of mine. And uh, we just kind of winged it with a couple credit cards and about 20 grand saved up and a couple junky trucks and just went for it and started first our TLC brand um, back in the late 90s. And then that's still alive and well, but I kind of found myself getting bored because I found while I love classics, I was less and less engaged with the archaic mechanical reality. So three on the tree, drum brakes and all that, screw it. And I found I was so sort of perverted by all of the beautiful little luxuries and creature comforts of modern vehicles, but found they never held my interest for longer than six months. So then Icon was born on the dumb idea of what would that look like, right? How can we maybe get the best of both worlds? Can we take something vintage, takes a very deep level of control over the design, laser scan, get it into CAD, convert, all the polygons to true surface data, and then in chorus engineer the whole thing and add all of this stuff that I do appreciate for modern cars. And that was, uh, that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah, you know, you do something I, I, I love because um, we owned a bunch of classic off-roaders. Uh, first we got, um, my son found a, a 68 Bronco half cab uh, well, up in, uh, uh, Canyon City, where, that's in Colorado where all the prisons are at, and you know, fun on Craigslist, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, 13000 for a classic half cab, you know, really good price, so we drove up there the next day, Andre came with me actually, and we just saw it, take it for a drive, and you know, put it on the truck and dr dragged it home, uh, and it was all original, 289, um, and we, we were going to do something that you do, you know, which is, or something that most people have done, that is lift it, cut it, um, and then it was just too pristine. I've never cut it now. That's one no, 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 we didn't. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it was too pristine and too nice, and all of our viewers were like, you can't touch that thing, so we ended up selling it to a, a museum in California where you're at, and then my son also happened to find um, a, a, a first-generation scout, uh, that had been in a bar for 17 years. We went and got that, dragged it home, uh, took out all the mouse out of it, <laughs> mouse crap, sorry. And uh, uh, the, the, the two things that those both those vehicles had in common were they were incredibly sexy and miserable to drive, right? Because because the cool thing about these old vehicles is you're like going back into a time capsule. And, you know, with the Scott, it was a 62 with the... Uh, Bronco was a 68, but like you said, three on the tree, you know, brakes that are, you know, out of the Flintstones, and, and it's just a vehicle that, that you want to love, but when you get on the road, you feel like it's dangerous, like it's a tractor, 
it's loud. It does. I mean, the, the Scout had this little half. It was a half of a V8 that they put into the Scout, right? It was well, a and, and that's what the first two years, right? Yeah, so yeah. You roll the damn window down. Yeah. It had like the Defender windows. Series yeah. One slider. Yeah. Right. And and a, told me Raymond Lowy actually one of his disciples, ex studio members at Studebaker, quit to go over to IH and was in a jam. And supposedly, like off the record, Lowy did a lot of the design work. And if you're a fan of his work, especially if you study like his early stuff he did, like his refrigerators for Frigidaire, the design, his language is all over that truck. I'm dying mm. to do one. I want to do black, nickel, and white, super clean, super retro scout. First if, we, if, we still, if we still had it, I'd ship it over to you. It was absolutely pristine, absolutely untouched. It was red and silver uh, with the red interior, power takeoff, everything. But it was a tractor, you know, and, and, and at some point uh, you just don't feel safe or it's not very enjoyable driving. And so what well, you do is you make those vehicles like, you know, like something that you can actually enjoy and love and feel safe and good about driving today versus, you know, terrified of driving. Really uh, all about trying to uh, remove the martyrdom. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, of course, you know, I just mentioned the Scout and I mentioned the Bronco, but you're known for Toyotas, specifically the FJ series. Um, so talk to me about Toyotas. What makes Toyota so, um, so special in the off-road world? Why is that the one that you're kind of at least known for in a lot of ways? Yeah, I mean, when we started the Icon brand, we launched it specifically with our version of the FJ40. And then over the years, we've evolved it into four different body styles that either never existed, but we thought it would be cool if they did, or we reinterpreted non-USA versions that were sort of a holy grails. Mm -hmm. And then over time, we've expanded to include a production version of the Bronco and the 47 to 53 Chevy truck like that cool one behind you on that black and white. But we launched with the FJ because that's the one that was closest to our heart. And in turn, the TLC brand decades prior was also launched on it because of my deep fascination and appreciation for them, which really happened overseas more than anything. So Africa and Australia and sometimes in Asia, but really mostly for me personally, it was experiences in Africa. You know, when you're talking about locales which a lot of westerners can't even get their head around and it exists right here in our own country but in a lot of situations i mean your vehicle is the difference between you living or you dying so towed enough land rovers uh out of situations throughout <laughs> africa to go okay mental note you know and then talking to the drivers literally talking to one of the fleet maintenance guys at this this private um range and he's like yeah i'm kind of bored i don't really know what to do i keep talking the owners into like some cool arb upgrades but like we ran landies for decades and i was constantly busy and i had a staff of 10 and we converted to 70 78 or 75 troop series cruisers like five years ago and he's like i'm down to three guys and like we go fishing a lot we don't really have much work to do sorry i know i'm gonna catch some crap from the Land Rover aficionados, and I do have a love-hate thing with them, but <laughs> yeah, when I came back to the States and one day was just looking for a fun vehicle, I always liked something different than what everyone else has, and I wanted something pretty much it was going to be used for, you know, the Pomona swap meet lugging used car parts and ephemera, antique weekend swap meets, surfing, camping, hauling my dogs, and then later my kids to skate parks as they got older. Um, so I just seeked out a really nice old FJ40 and started geeking out and just kind of one thing led to another. But you know, at that time, nobody gave a damn. So they would, at most, you'd see one with like a $600 Earl Scheib paint job and some Pepoy chrome wheels and a leftover cast iron 305 out of the wreck Monte Carlo or whatever, you know, the people sort of cobbled together. And I was at the time taking a business class, uh, an extension class at USC in, in business. And I got into this stupid debate with another student and the professor about supply and demand, because my thinking was, keep in mind, this is right at the time this thing, the internet started happening, right? And I'm like, supply and demand is gone. 
now if you can control or somehow promote and reposition the supply, you can create the demand. And they're like, ah, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. So it turned into a, like a thousand dollar bet, I think it was. And I was given six months to drive a trackable product up 30 points to win the bet. And I just happened to be looking for something to do and an excuse for road trips at the time. So uh, it fit the bill perfectly. And that's what I did. I went back to collect on that years, about a year later. And they're like, oh, we were joking. What are you talking about? But uh, it, it, it gave me a little bit of proof to the pudding of my sort of half-cooked idea that allowed me when I was on vacation with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife and co-founder of both brands who work together, and said, look, why don't we do what we love? Let's quit our jobs, let's go home, and let's just jump in and see if we can make this work. And, and that's what we did. We've just kind of been running ever since. So, you know, a lot of people restore old cars, right? And, you know, I've, I've been to Pebble Beach enough to know that a lot of people over restore old cars, but you take it that next step. I mean, what you do is you not only restore it, but you put your own design aesthetic on it. Was that the part that you wanted to do or was it the restoration? Was it both? I mean, how did you decide to go from just, you know, here's an old FJ, let's fix it up to here's an old FJ, let's make it something that is a hybrid of kind of what I believe is aesthetically pleasing and cool uh, and what Toyota at the time thought was aesthetically pleasing and cool. Well, I mean, I think for me organically, both of my brands and arguably everything I create starts with me merely going, gosh, where could I get this? Like who's doing this? And my stupid ideas, it seems I never find anyone else doing it. So then I'm like, well, that could be cool to build. So like with Icon, you know, TLC was doing great and growing, but I defined the brand in, in a way that just Toyota Land Cruisers, just dead stocks. It was like this very small confine, which after a number of years kind of was getting a little boring for me creatively. And then I'm also a big engineering geek and I love antiques and material sciences. And there's all these elements that I'm constantly experiencing and absorbing and seeing and witnessing that I wanted to integrate into my projects. But for many years at home, you know, I was over restoring cars dead stock. And after four miles, five miles, I'm like, well, that's beautiful. But wow, that sucks to drive. Like I'm sweating like crazy. I, my teeth are sh loose in my head. My fillings fell out. Like, it doesn't stop, it doesn't steer, this sucks. And I move on, so it had always been something in my mind that I wanted to evolve and do. So I think the, the key impetus was after my commission by Toyota to design and build the first three pre-production design study vehicles that eventually became the FJ Cruiser. Not only did that give me an opportunity to get sort of a glimpse behind the curtain at Oz of how they work and what their processes are like mm. and sort of see most importantly, by the way, the one they were ashamed of, which was the San Bernardo, the Campo factory outside of, um, well, actually in a, in a suburb in, um, in um, Brazil. Um, and it uh, is where they built what was called the Bandarante. It was just phenomenal, but like they were totally ashamed because it was so not Kaizen. You know, they literally imported engine parts, glass, and raw materials. And in one industrial complex, casting, forging, stamping, they were making the ring and pinion gears, the axle housings, everything. And it was a massive eye-opener for me. So that juxtaposed by visiting Toyota factory and, you know, at that time, the Tacoma factory that uh, Elon took over and a couple manufacturing facilities in Japan – like I got back and saw where Toyota took my design. I went back to key people, key leadership at Toyota and said, guys, I kind of want to start this new brand. I want to call it Icon. You know how much I love the FJ40. I certainly want to start it by revisiting the FJ40 my way. Because by that time, I had like a full virtual high detailed 3D model in my head which I always do this. It's sort of my version of sheep jumping the fence to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I'm building out whatever design I'm working on in like a 
theoretical model in my head and refining it and refining and refining it. And invariably, either the idea sucks and it implodes, or it'll get to the point that I, I like in my soul, I have to see that physically realized to maintain my remaining sanity. And that's exactly what happened with Icon. I taught, I, Toyota gave me a very polite verbal bow of support and stay, you know, said they weren't going to make it difficult for us legally. I already own many of the vintage trademarks like FJ40 that they had never filed. Mm -hmm. And I just already had it in my head. So I took one key employee and we sequestered ourselves in a separate building, turned the music up loud and the phone off and just realized what was keeping me up at night. And that was the beginning. I think, I think you have a dream job. Because I think you're I think, mostly right. I, I think for a lot of truck enthusiasts and car enthusiasts and automotive enthusiasts, I think they have that design. It could be any vehicle, right? It doesn't matter what vehicle that is. For example, I really want to own a lot of Neva four-wheel drive, yeah. right? But I, I, know, I know that when I get into it and when I see that if engine. The door doesn't, if the door opens, first of all, you can't make that assumption. Right. And, and then, and how, you know, how probably terrible, you know, it's that picture on the wall, right? You're looking at that picture and you're like, I want to own that, but I don't want to drive that, you know? <laughs> so, so now you've you turned There's a guy doing Nevas. I think they're in Europe. I just saw them on Uncrate or one of the cool design blogs. And they're doing like a safari four by four style Neva. And I, I can't unfortunately remember the name of the brand. They do beautiful aesthetic motorcycles as well. I when are you going to do Nevis? Nevis? When are you yeah. doing Nevis? So I, first of all, I do have a Neva story and I have pictures to prove it <laughs> with my, I have a children's charity called go campaign. And we did one of the first American programs in Cuba before it was technically legal for us to even be there. It's like we had a charter a plane and the whole nine but I took advantage of that by bringing about a hundred pounds in my backpack of like soldering wire, old school glass fuses, light bulbs, like all the stuff that I researched that they're dying for and can't get. And some like try five Chevy parts to ingratiate myself with the local car community. First night I'm there like, two in the morning, fairly intoxicated with severely intoxicated friends. And we're in a lot of Neva cab and the entire exhaust system just says, I've had enough. And we're on the Maricon, which is like on the water there. And the exhaust system drops and impales itself on the pavement, brings us to this massive stop. Oh, wow. So here I am drunk with a iPhone light propped up on the asphalt in a pothole underneath it with my shoestrings and some bailing wire and duct tape. And we, we patched it back together and we got back home and the, the cabbie was quite happy. Okay. <laughs> well, then, you know, that, that is always the irony of like classic cars, right? The, the ones that you spent, that's why Triumphs and all those old British cars are so endearing because you end up spending so much time working on them that you fall in love with them, right? It's like, it's like that relationship you have with the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the easiest relationships are the least, uh, engaging, whereas, you know, the ones that are the most uh, operatic, let's say, are the ones yeah, that are like always the, the most memorable. The most psychotic girlfriend you've ever had. Yeah, exactly, yeah. The craziest experience that you put up with a bunch of craziness for a while, and then one day you wake up and go, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so have you have you done a car that's like that, that's been that, you know, some cars like fight you all the way. Can you think yes. of one that you've done that's been like that? Of, which which I one? Of several, unfortunately. <laughs> I think I've learned a couple key lessons without getting mark specific first. Okay. Size and era. So personally, you start to lose me by the mid 70s because the quality and the priorities in the engineering and design execution, in my humble opinion, not so humble maybe, is that they're misguided. They weren't for the sake of design or engineering. They were about Wall Street and the pencil pushers and scalability and platform sharing. So like we did a 90s X cop car Caprice classic build, absolute disaster. Because at some point you're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and it's still gonna sink because you have nothing to work with. Um, I'd also say scale of the platform. It's incredible, the smaller a platform, 
the exponential increase in limitations to how far you can evolve and where you're going to put all of the modern content greatly complicates life. And uh, back to the defenders. I think they're gorgeous. I mean, I like series one, series two, A's of whatever, all of them, all the way through to the NAS. But the execution is just a disaster. I mean, just what are you guys thinking? Why? Because the dude who actually designed it and penned it, he had nothing to do with the execution. So therefore, it was driven by completely different mandates. Yeah, so you were saying the Defender, you outsource stores. <laughs> yeah, I, I just kind of try and politely send people to other places because everything from the fact that the body is angle iron with pieces of cloth thrown uh, in between the next layer of aluminum that gets riveted to the sheet metal. So they're an anodic rust factory. Like even boat builders since the 40s knew that was a bad idea. Um, and no symmetry. Like we'll do a CNC amazing like billet 6061 grill. I'll true it up in CAD. It'll be all crisp 90s. We'll go fit it on the vehicle. And oh no, it's 89.32 on this side. And it's 91.7 on the other side and then the ergonomics are just funky and some of them i can control others i can't so yeah i think um even the rolls royce that that 58 silver cloud derelict we did you know the the chassis the frame rails the ladder frame is two layers of sheet metal bench broke together put on top of each other seam pinched and uh, gas welded and it's like uh, I don't know guys <laughs> yeah you know you know I have a buddy who owns a classic British uh, restor restoration shop in Denver probably one of the better ones in the country uh, and he has this book on his shelf and there was something like I want to say like 1500 cottage industry cars to start out in Britain after the Second World War right and so it wasn't like here in America where, where, where it was industrialized to begin with right it was these guys building cars in their shed that eventually became Triumph and, you know, BSA and all these other yeah. British companies. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll just give you one story. It's about you, but it's an interesting story. I was, I was in California at Ford and I was, got picked up by Ford and the guy who picked me up used to be the head of Ford's um, uh, luxury car. Uh, it was like, the, it wasn't luxury cars, but they had, you know, when they bought Volvo and Land Rover and Jaguar, right? They oh, had is a, that, a, uh, what's his name? I think it's Mark, like absurdly tall, super yeah, energetic. Yeah. yeah, lovely guy. And he, he was telling me that, you know, when they, when they bought Jaguar, they bought it because I think Bill Ford just liked the brand. There was no, like, you know, due diligence, like, let's see if this is a business plan. It's like, I want Jaguar. And so they went over there uh, to, to, I think it's Coventry, right? That's where Jaguars are built. Uh, and they went to the factory. And this wasn't that long ago. We're not talking, like, 1960s. We're talking, like, you know, like 15, 20 years ago. And they were still building those cars on uh, a shop that had uh, dirt floors, right? That's <laughs> I mean, you know, you could, you could draw that line right back to the shed. And I think that's what you're talking about, right? It's, it, 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 it yeah, that and small teams, small resources. They had to, God bless them in many cases, MacGyver solutions. Or they didn't have a press break. And they, they're like, no, we can only do 16 gauge on that shit. So we'll just do two layers of 16 gauge. And, you know, or we'll use wood for the chassis or whatever. And then yeah. also post-war, there was significant materials shortage that they didn't have the industrial might or this sort of uh, let's get industry going again that like the WPA program in the United States had to allow them access to those resources. So they were just doing what they could with what they had. Now, is that a valid excuse as we get into the 80s and 90s? Arguably, no, but it still happened. I mean, look at Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah, very small company. People think it's a big company. It's a very small, small brand. So um, what's, what are your favorite cars to do? I know besides the FJs, what, you know, what, can well, you kind of go down the list of other cars that like, I'm a client, I come to you and I bring something. Where do you, at what point do you go, oh, and at what point do you go like that? If you say, I'm looking for a 1980, I'm already out. Okay. Generally. All right. Um, although there are some freak exceptions, like I'm just dumb enough that I want to do an Aston Martin Lagonda. It's okay. such a beautiful disaster of a car. I just so dig them. 
And I had a childhood memory of Evil Knievel rolling up in one when I was interning at a famous local LA hot rod shop as a teenager and evil rolled up in one that just sealed the deal for me. Like mm -hmm. I am going to have to have one of those. I have a, I have a friend who has one. So I've driven one of those Lagandas. Um, just they're horrible, but they're so cool. Be careful of the dashboard. That's all just, you know, the <laughs> Oh, that no, no, no. If I do one, everything out. Okay, good. Yeah, you don't want that electronic out. dashboard. No, 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 no. no no cathode ray tubes, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. none of that crap is going to happen. Uh, in fact, there's a dude who has a retrofit iPad control system where you just put an iPad in the dash that does all the things that that car inevitably did but promised to do. It's just a little bit too far ahead wow. of the time. All right, so, so Lagando, what else? What, what yeah, so like 80s and up, I'm out. Um, oh, I'm hold on. How about, how about a square favorite? box? Say what? How about a square bodied uh, uh, Chevy pickup? 80s, you know, those are kind of the, the, they're becoming very popular. We had one for a while. Don't like them? I mean, again, to me, go buy grandpa's that had a camper shell on it and got never driven. That's a hyper virgin low model and just enjoy it for what it is. Okay, fair but enough. But if you take that, try and do rack companion and Brembo's or Evolve suspension and powertrain. There's not enough integrity, hmm. arguably, from that perspective in the base componentry to allow it to really be revolutionized. To the opposite extreme, same experience, pre-United Steel structure bodies, which in the European case could go as late as the late 40s, early 50s, in the US manufacturing generally ended mid to 30s. If you have a wooden substructure upon which tin is hammered and literally nailed onto it. I can't do anything with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess I could with open checkbook and literally forensically disassemble it, map it, CNC, billet, sub truss systems and reskin it, but it would not be much fun financially for somebody. But like my favorite design eras invariably, like something about the year 1937. And cars built around that time just so speak to me. And then in various forms and from different models, all the way up to about the Korean War, and then European stuff and key iconic American cars hold me up until the early 70s. But um, like I want to do that first gen international scout, even the 58 travel all is so trippy. That'd be mm -hmm. kind of a fun one to do. That Laganda, I want to do Volvo 1800 Sport Wagon or an ES, the earliest, the, the um, Jensen bodied rust bucket ones, 63 through 65, the purest form of that design. I mean, there's a long list. I, I'm such a geek of automotive history. There's so much weird stuff I want to do through to like open checkbook. Let's say I get bought by an OEM and they're dumb enough to still let me run the creative department. I'd love to attack and piss off the purists and do my own 300 SL Roadster and Gullwing, but like hydroformed aluminum, no donor car involved, current production AMG tech, mechanical, but the retro, there's certain cars that just have such continuity in the design that to be able to make it evolve into something that's daily relevant and usable. I mean, even going back into super obscure stuff like 6C, 8C Alphas, there were so many built by so many custom body craft Carissiers and stuff. Never an ugly one. All of them were kick-ass. You know, if, um, if any of our manufacturer OEM friends are listening here. Um, I think what you said is brilliant. I would love to see like an icon, you know, like 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 AMG is to Mercedes, Icon could be to Toyota uh, as an in-house, you know, uh, customizer of premium vehicles. I, I think that's a brilliant idea. I, and I think I think with you know nowadays, let's face it, crossovers and trucks are becoming everything, and cars are kind of waning in, in their relevance. At least that trend does not seem to be slowing down. It would be really cool for somebody like Toyota to actually have an in-house uh, brand like yours. I, I would be all over that. I would be all over that. Yeah, I think like my ultimate dream would be to have their resources, yeah. be wholly independent and be brand agnostic. So when Mercedes has like some kick-ass special anniversary, 
to do a heritage technology mashup within their brand catalog and history would be phenomenal. The other thing is, you know, since inception working with SEMA to develop that new law for ultra low volume vehicular manufacturers, we actually have that law carefully phrased wherein an OEM could own up to 49% of an entity such as ICON. And they would be exempt from billions of dollars in testing and content to be able to, and also have the freedom to be more progressive, God forbid, and like try new design languages and, and techni technologies and motive power without risking their entire brand on it and come to market within 12 month development cycle and just get a feel for things and, and test directions and trends and tech. So I think, yeah, that, that could be interesting, but I'd also argue that almost invariably the culture of large scale automotive manufacturing, uh, unfortunately would probably not see any value in such a relationship. Well, Mercedes saw it in AMG, right? Those were a bunch of guys doing what you're doing, you know, you know. That was then. Yeah, that was then. Uh, but maybe. Hey, look, I, I, I wouldn't, I'd love to have that conversation. It'd be fun. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, we, we have a massive disruption right now happening in the industry with electric and with Tesla, right? Tesla, Elon, we were talking about before we started, has uh, completely gone in and re, I think he has reimagined and re um, engineered and in a way reinvented car production and car ownership and car sales, right? I mean, he, he, it's a classic disruptor. He took everything and, and took it apart and built it together in a much different way. Uh, and, you know, the, the stock market is saying that, that Tesla is worth more than a lot of the, let's call them legacy manufacturers at this point. I know, I'm sure they would hate to hear it, but it, 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 it's, it's going down that road. So maybe we are at a moment in time when, when change is possible and when, you know, um, something like that could happen. Uh, but let me ask you another question, okay? You love Japanese off-roaders, right? And, and, and this is a question I have yet to have a good answer to, so maybe you have it. Every Japanese brand except for one has great off-roaders, and that is Honda. Why does Honda not build any off-roaders except for their motorcycles and side-by-sides? What, what is up with that? You know, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I share your pain. Yeah. I, too, have asked that question, and I've asked that question like when Ken was at Honda and like to some serious leadership at Honda. No one will give me a straight answer. Not a word. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't I, get I, it. I'm, I'm I mean, what, you. you've got the ch chick repellent vehicle, you got the CRV, what else do you want, right? <laughs> and look, look, I mean, the, the, what's it called, the, their pickup truck unibody you know, The Ridgeline. 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 I love how that's evolved. Yeah, but like, it doesn't have a low range. Correct. So, I mean, they're missing, but to me, I always thought, ah, here they come, they're going to get into this. And then they yeah. never seem to grow and continue. Even Hyundai, you know? with their massive industrial experience and, you know, heavy truck and equipment and all that stuff, even they started going down that road and then sort of backed off of it again. There's rumors they're going back down that road yet again. Um, but I was a design consultant on a really exciting project they were doing about, must be 12 years ago. And like the whole U.S. based design team at the time was just super excited. Poof. Disappeared, yeah. Yeah, that happens so, a lot, I think. Yeah, yeah. there is not enough risk taking once again, right? But but look so at GM. Focus groups. <laughs> but look Where's at GM. GM. They're bringing back the Hummer brand. <laughs> that's if that's not risk taking, I don't know what what is risk risk taking. Oh man, if if Hummer comes out EV hybrid intensive in its core focus, maintaining utility and capability, I think they're in a uniquely good position. To make a go of it because there are some other manufacturers right you know smaller manufacturers like Bollinger and to some extent you know Nikola and some others trying to do the same thing but GM has the budget right GM has kind of you know that might that some of these other smaller manufacturers don't and uh, you know people always underestimate brand equity so I mean there's still I mean I get weekly requests to do Hummer builds. Like, hmm. I mean, it's, it's on. There's, there's a tribe. 
Uh, John, just so you know, Andre is a proud Hummer owner, so he's got an H2, just so, just oh, so cool. you're you know, on the same page when we're having this conversation. There's also those new guys, um, Millspec, I think they're yes. called, yeah. that are uh, doing what appear to be pretty promising up, whatever, Humvees. upfitting of H1s, of Humvees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so several people up upfitting, once again, kind of more traditional uh, classic design, and modern tech, right? So it's that marriage of, you know, cool design, really square and boxy and, you know, utilitarian and some newer technology going in there. But now, if the Cybertruck comes out and it has a two-speed transfer case, I will buy one and completely disembody it and repurpose <laughs> it. That's a no-brainer. I'll pay that just for the damn battery pack and a Reinhardt controller. <laughs> Just buy the whole damn truck and take it apart. We're actually doing that on a C20 right now. So, you know, we do a bunch of one-off projects that we call, there's two classes. The platforms vary wildly, but they're called derelicts or reformers. The reformers are all concourse, beautiful, con you know, fully done up with many details elevated and redesigned, but true to the original design era usually. Then the derelicts, we leave them looking barn fine, ratty, honest, original patina the same mechanical re-engineering approach underneath them. So there's, uh, there's, there's opportunities there as I look at various platforms of like what to jump into, what to remix, what to revisit. And that would be on the list. Tell us more about the reformer, the 100, the F100 yeah, 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 truck you just did. I was going to say, you just finished one of those. Yeah, that truck came out so good. I'm super excited about it. So it's a 70. It's a camper special. Uh, we bought it on good old Craigslist in Southern Cal, running and driving, original family owner, original blue and yellow plates, original down to the dealership license plate frame. Hmm. And I just fell in love with it. I didn't have anyone looking for one, but I just grabbed it because it was really in the prime condition. I mentioned it on Instagram. I did one posting. An existing client reached out because I, I bought it thinking I'd, I'd love to talk someone into building a derelict out of this thing, right? So I did that. An existing client that we've built several vehicles for and owns the Icon Watch as well reached out and says, oh, I used to have one of those. I love it. Let's do it. That's great. And it turned out it was in good enough condition that give or take a couple weeks of service, simple maintenance work. We put it back into roadworthy condition. And the wait time for me to start on the job was so long. I said, you know what? This is actually a great opportunity. I love it. Ideally, when the client, less ideally, but still cool when I have the opportunity to get s time, as I so non-poetically call it, in a vehicle before we attack it. Because you invariably, you're going to have an incredible opportunity and visibility to write the yay list and the nay list of, wow, that was kick. We got to keep that trait alive or what the hell were they thinking with that that was really stupid or ah the pencil pushers made him use the falcon part there but it has no continuity with the design language of the truck so that goes on the list of low-hanging obvious opportunities to elevate and create more continuity in the design so anyway i talked too much client took delivery of it drove it did a big road trip um, from our shop all the way up to Northern Cal on the one, did a big adventure. By the end of that first trip, called and said, I am in love with this thing. It rides like crap. It steers like crap. It stops like crap. But I absolutely love it. And then he changed focus and said he wanted to do a reformer instead of a derelict. And he brought it back. And interestingly enough, his list contained a few of the items that were already on my list. And he had, a, a from our working experience, sort of one of my dream equations of he didn't even want to enter the kitchen, you know. He just said, look, build it like you're going to keep it. Here are the basic things that I'm going to do with it and want it. Otherwise, have at it. And boy, did we. I mean, that truck, the transition of how it feels, stops, steers, rides, pulls, sound DB level, other than those big Dumbo mirrors are still out on the freeway. Uh, is just so significant. It, it it really was a really great one to see from before and after. Really happy with it.
So, so you just said something interesting. Build it like you're going to keep it. Which ones have you kept? So unfortunately, I'm still at that point in my career where I'm reinvesting just about every dime back into the company. Um, I built the first derelict, which is a 52 mashup Chrysler Town and Country meets DeSoto Custom station wagon, um, which is another visceral, honest story of the brand. I was like, okay, I'm tired of over restoring things. By then I was already, you know, doing significant engineering and mod changes and over restoring them. And I'm like, I don't want to even deal with that. Cause that again, martyrdom of the first scratch, the first ding, Oh, I can't take it there cause they have valet and I don't want that valet driving it or, Oh, there's a dirt road. I can't get there. Like to hell with that. So the first derelict was that wagon just because I had a half cooked stupid idea that was keeping me up at night of like, Oh, the patina on that thing's killer. And like, I don't live anywhere with salt on the roads. Like what if I could just leave all that, but then get all the tech into it. So I kept that. Um, I think that was good. I had to sell everything else. That one was featured on, I think, I remember seeing that it was like Car and Driver, one of the big publications featured. It got tons of love. In fact, yeah. it was all of the love. It won some design awards. It was on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine. Yeah, um, really well. Tons, tons of media on it. And I think, again, at that point, you know, because, again, I'm always coming up with stupid ideas that no one else is sort of doing just because the way I see the world, I guess, and I think that was another case of me being super thrilled to find I was embraced by people going, I've always wanted that equation or, or, you know, for example, with icon in general, a lot of our clients aren't your traditional car collector. They've yearned for those classics. Maybe they've bought them and tired of them quickly because the, the, the true experience is so divorced from the rosy, tinted glasses of memory that, you know, they're like, again, understanding they can sort of find a bridge between those two worlds. But that first day, like I built it, finished it and was driving it and it started getting attention and it started winning stuff before my dumbass went, Oh, well, I can keep doing those. Cause in essence, it's the same. It speaks to the religion that is icon. It's just a different way of, mashing up vintage and modern so then we just came up with the term derelict and have been building them ever since and a little secret they're hands down the any of the one-offs including the reformers and the derelicts are by far my personal favorite because they're full of idiocies of engineering deep dives and design studies and different material uses and languages that we breathe into them horrible business they're extremely expensive for the end user. And for us, the amount of resources, space, and time they take, I mean, we're lucky to clear five points profit on them when they're done. But it's kind of a client-funded research and development arm, too. You know, like just, this pickup, we look at it, my whole team, even the FJ team, and obviously the Bronco guys, all of my team is like, Oh, I think it's so cool. We should start building those. Mm. And a lot of the engineering, for once in my life, I can do a little platform sharing because a lot of my Bronco content applies over to that pretty efficient. You know, um, I just sold, uh, we, I found a, a pretty pristine uh, Comanche, which was kind of the holy grail. It was rust free, it was a short bed, uh, which is hard to find, four wheel drive, um, and um, Stick straight, shift, straight six, yeah, straight yeah. six, and, and actually Mark Allen. You know, I don't know if you know Mark. He's yeah, a, sure, Mark. Yeah, he was going to buy it, and then I was kind of bummed about it because I knew I had to sell it to him because I, I I can't say no to Mark. But I ended up selling it to one of one of our viewers, and, and he donated a bunch of money to charity, which was nice. But I kind of figured something out for me. You know, um, I fi I figure I never own the cars; they own me. I'm just a steward of the cars, right? Eventually, they're going to get passed along. And I'm a crazy. You know, I do videos and I watch all the car shows, and I'm always 
really bummed out when I see like Wayne on chasing classic cars go to someone's house and then there's some like derelict Ferrari sitting in the garage because a guy, you know, something broke on it and the guy got old eventually, you know, ended up dying and then the wife sells it off. And I, I don't want to be that, right? So I, I kind of compress that ownership experience into a much shorter period, right? So you can have all the fun of it is finding it, then the real fun is fixing it, and then it's actually fun selling it. Uh, and, and I think people forget that that's also fun. And, and oftentimes people think like, I found the perfect thing. I'm going to hold on to it for the rest of my life. I'm like, no, let somebody else enjoy it. I've, I've been a good steward of the thing. Pass it on. Uh, and so that's how I kind of figured it out. For you know me. Interesting. I'm with you on that. And by the way, if it wasn't going to be Mark Allen, next in line would have been Rick. <laughs> right? Pow, pow, he said Poway. Yeah, Poway. Anyway, Rick Poway. Yeah, yeah anyway, he would have been all up on that. Yeah. Although he does prefer a nice flathead. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Um, gosh, my brain is going in many directions at once. Ever so briefly, we're doing a 75 Cherokee. We bought the early Kaiser nose pickup. Yep. We're taking the steel fender flares, front clip, IP, and dash from the early Gladiator into the 75 to create kind of a revisionist history Cherokee two-door with uh, the new Hemi, create fuelie in it and stuff. So that's going to be good fun. And then cool. the, where else was I going with this? All right, all right. Hold on. Before you keep going, can, can we be the first to feature that? Sure. It's going to yeah, be when it's ready. wild. And we're doing yeah, a really come fun. Yeah, come on out. Yeah. We're doing a deep yeah, do. dive into the actual Cherokee tribe history because, unfortunately, typical Americana, right? Let's call it some engine name, but like the graphic on it, the fake tooled leather pattern, they're all inappropriate and incorrect and have no relationship with the truck. So like we did a deep dive down to, I actually had the opportunity to speak to a Cherokee chief. And we like, I did a deep dive into straw work and pottery and woven goods and all these killer patterns. And we, I fell in love with this one pattern that implies like an eagle feather so it's like these v's and stacked widths going along and i was careful because i didn't want to pull like chevy did with the chevy nova marketing in mexico and nova yeah. means doesn't go so i talked to the chief like does this say like you know you're a dumb white man and you should die on my land or like what does it mean and it was basically a blessing for safe adventures for safe travel like perfect and then like the leather interior, instead of that stamped dielectric faux Sheridan toolmaker leather, which again, wasn't even referencing tribal language. I'm a massive uh, leather craftsman is one of my side craftsmanship deep dive hobbies. And a friend of mine is in charge of Bolin saddles who do like, you know, Tom Nix and like all the famous, all the museums, all the old Western stuff. So we're hand tooling the entire interior in saddle leather, butterfly filleted mirrored down the console center line, mm, and then changing wow. the pattern to reflect that time in Southern California, Western culture. So like we're doing all sorts of really stupid, fun, deep dive stuff on that build. It's, it's going to be a really, really interesting one. When is it well, going to be love done? Feature. Yeah, when it's going to be done. Well, right now, we're out of CAD, we're out of render, we're still 3D printing, test fitting certain things. Like I just couldn't make the fuel gas cap exposed work. Then I was gonna do a mailbox sheet metal fuel door, but then I revised the Cherokee Chief amulet on the rear D pillar, or I guess C pillar in that case. And I wanted that to be where your eye went. So then, Again, blessed by a great client who's a geek, who I said, okay, well, you know, and he's been pushing me. Like he owns one of the D200 crew cabs that I built. And he's like, best vehicle, and he owns crazy cars. He's like, I have had more adventures and more fun, and it's so different and subtle. He goes, but it, what more could we do this time? And what else could you do? So he like keeps pushing me into more and more unreasonable ideas that I already had. So like, what about what about sterling silver for all the trim? Like it would look like chrome if you don't know any better, but it'd be really cool in what age weather and then and on and on into the tooled leather and all these electives. So our big deep dive for the last week or so has been uh, making the driver's side 
tail light uh, on a hydraulic arm with a tuck and dive so that we can hide the fuel filler there. Also, that generation Jeep and Kaiser products do not like modern fuel fillers at gas stations. No matter what you do, they can't take the fill rate, so they just barf the fuel right back at you. So here's our uh, 3D printed first article sample, and then our uh, CAD emulation for it. I don't even know, yeah, that's a video. So we're just getting a, a sense of the fulcrum point and, and how to make it work. And, you know, stupid stuff like this, like, oh, it's a great idea. And it's easy to say, yeah, 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 I want that too. What people don't realize is, okay, first of all, the entire build is unnecessary. But, like, just this brilliant, stupid 50-50 idea, like, that can be hundreds of hours just in emulation and CAD and 3D printing to even figure out how to make – the stupid idea work right, then machining and, you know, and on and on and on. And again, I'm like dream client. He goes, but it's something more, you know, and it's not superfluous. It, it adds to the usability and eases your life and experience with it. And he's, he's letting me go for it. So Very when cool. will it be done? What do you think? Or is it, is it ongoing? <laughs> so we're in white now. So raw metal chassis, raw metal body trying to be patient with Mopar performance. He's been trickling me parts. And um, that's another story, but uh, we'll probably be, what we do is we build those one-offs three times. So we should be at the point where all sheet metal is done, all gapping is done, harness is routed, grommets, poles, chassis, exhaust is tigged and brushed, everything's done and raw, no fluids, take it apart in six to eight months. Then it'll take another six months to make all that stuff pretty and then forensically reassemble it that last time. So we're probably, our target at least has been to show it off by SEMA next year. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Well, we'd love to have a crack at showing it off to our fans and viewers, thank you for that. And sure. before I let you go, Jonathan, we, we have to, of course, talk about the Bronco. Now, I know you were involved in the current design and you've got an NDA with Ford, uh, so we won't get too deep into kind of uh, I can that either, part of it. I can neither confirm or recant anything you just said. Okay, so n none of that is true, or maybe it is true. Uh, but um, are you excited that there's a new Bronco coming and do you think Ford's gonna do it right? Yes, yes, and hell yes. I okay, was quite good. concerned about it for a number of years. Um, from what I hear, uh, they did an unparalleled job of respecting the heritage without turning it into kind of an anime re-retro visitation cul-de-sac. Yep. And I think more importantly, I hear... There are some beautiful ideas that really connected to the utilitarian roots of such a class of vehicles that we could both, we already have offline, bitch together about the fact that that's not even considered anymore. Um, but they've not only honored the traditional functionality that true users are going to demand, and the fact that we're tired of getting bullied into set packages and that this is going to be an epically modular vehicle for the aftermarket and people to really personalize as it must be if they're really going to go up against Jeep. But they've created new functionalities, I've heard, and utilities that speak to that history and extend it. And, and like, oh, my God, it does that? Like stuff people are not even – I'm not even thinking of you. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, people, don't, people, I don't think people, most people know that the original Bronco came in three flavors, right? There was the half cab, which was the pickup. There was the SUV, which everybody knows. Yeah, and then there was a the roadster, yeah. right? Which was no top, no doors. It was that utilitarian. Um, and, um, you know, with Jeep and Wrangler, um, God, uh, two years ago in May, Jonathan, Wrangler mm -hmm. sold 20, 5,000 units. It's unbelievable. You know, a Wrangler in a month. In one month. 
could sell 25,000. Oh, no, 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 no. They could have sold a hell of a lot more. They just had production limitations yeah, that, at that time, yeah. keeps them from fully taking advantage of that. And I think that's a very unfortunate situation with vehicles such as the FJ Cruiser that from my perspective, as I had envisioned it, I almost feel like they were scared of going up against Jeep. And in fact, um, I think uh, Ford um, should be very careful about not just benchmarking, oh, you know, your typical spreadsheet research mm -hmm. department, you know, oh, the carbon capacity of 54 square, this is, and we have to be 54.2. And like, no, no, it's not about that. It's, a, it's more a religion, a holistic understanding of the integrity and functionality of a platform that is the imperative. Don't get stuck on your little stats comp spreadsheet stuff. And I think, you know, Toyota could have nailed it with the FJ Cruiser. Although there, I don't know if you've been hearing the same rumors. Um, I haven't heard it direct from Toyota, but I've been hearing uh, out of Japan and North America some talk about a little resurrection potential. I would I would think that would just be natural with you know that segment of the market being so hot that there's just too much money to uh, you know to leave it on the table and let Ford and Jeep have all all the money. I think it's a reflection of kind of where we're at. I think people got really tired and bored of just real, especially with Toyota, right? Just cookie cutter appliances, not cars. Just make the grill bigger and the badge bigger, and let's talk about the connectivity and not just Toyota, like the amount of car commercials that barely show the car because it's devoid of expressing any opinion whatsoever, which their focus groups in Wall Street have told them is the best way to sell one widget to everyone, but results in a complete divorce of brand loyalty and relationship between the consumer and the actual machine, which kills me. But like, well, they'll talk about the damn Wi-Fi and the connectivity for the entire commercial. Mm -hmm. That's all you got? Like, is that yeah. what we're down to? It's just it's nuts to me. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why we're heading back to Tesla again. That's why Tesla's doing such a good job of breaking, breaking the 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 current um, a stalemate almost in, in in the way the cars are designed, built, and sold. You know, they proved that that you know for a long time people were saying, oh, the car is dead. It's not you know no, it's just going to be an appliance. It's going to be ride sharing, and I think all that's gone out the window. I think. I think we've proved that people can't divorce themselves from their car, can't divorce sex from their car, right? Can't divorce freedom from the car or truck. I mean, it, it's just an expression of who they are. And for a long time, there was this belief that with autonomy and electrification, cars are just going to be like eggs, right? That we all like get in. But I, I don't think that's where people are. I think most people are too passionate uh, and, and care too much. At least I hope so. To, 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 I'm, to I'm, I just turned 50. How old are you? I'm 56. So that's why you think that way. And, yeah. bless, and I hope you're right. Well, I have a son who's 21 who also is passionate. But talk to him about his friends. Like, I have a 21-year-old and an 18-year-old. Yeah. Both of them, when they were 15.51, dumped school that day with my approval to go get their permit. Yeah, my son as and well. We're already buying project cars, and, like, my 18-year-old has a killer – um, 2002 TII Roundy, little BMW, and he was, you know, he's been loving this lack of school, man. He's been in the garage upgrading it left and right. I don't even get to use a garage at my own house, and <laughs> I'm the, the pro top car builder with a one car garage that I'm not allowed to use, but I digress. But they were like the only kids in their class who gave a damn and did so. Everyone else, was like, oh, I've got Lyft, I've got Uber, why do I need that? So I think niche purveyors such as companies like me, I think we're going to be fine, right? Because like you've said, people are going to yearn for that visceral man-machine connection and the weekend car, the fun. I think going back to other points you've made, both of you that like, okay, Tesla, first everyone's like, oh, he's a nut job. That'll never happen. Now that ship has sailed. He's proven it. He's paved the road. He's created the market. Now other companies are playing catch up and won his space. However, this design by committee, Wall Street platform sharing, watering down of vehicular use intent and lack of personality in the finished product in an effort to appeal to everyone is a complete disaster. So I think the impetus on the tier ones, on the big car companies, 
is to get back to expressing an opinion in design and a function by model to re-embrace those consumers. And again, back to like questions I've asked CEOs, CMOs of huge multinational car companies, how are you guys going to address the inevitable fact that this volume game, which is the only game you've cared to play for decades, of being able to stand up at the shareholder meeting and go to Wall Street and say, oh, next year we're going to build more. And at the end of each year, you're giving them away to rental car companies or God knows what you're doing with them to play the numbers game, to make the numbers look good, to show you did, to say it again the next year. That's not sustainable. The emerging markets they're relying on are no longer emerging, are already plenty of competition or domestic or whatever it might be. So they can't keep playing this scalability game. And the other one battle that the OEMs globally have ever fought, how EU TUV compliance has nothing to do with DOT, FEMSS, US federal certifications. The complexities and costs that that has fit into the automotive industry all the way through to what you're paying, Mr. Consumer, for the new vehicle you buy, sometimes the compliances are within centimeters of each other. And everyone's got to get into this, mine's bigger than yours, and no one will get on the page. And hopefully culturally, right, this whole COVID pandemic on an interpersonal level makes us more aware that we're all on the same ship and we're all humans on the same planet dealing with ultimately similar realities. I hope we see that in business and in industry as well, because that would make for a better product, more successful companies that don't have to come out with their hand out looking for tax incentives and, you know, you know they're going to get bailed out here any day. And it would be better business, better world, better everything. And it's like, can we please, as humans, get out of our own ways? Like my granddad used to harp on me. And he's like, well, what he said was kind of crude. So probably not worthy of your audience. Um, I'd say it, and if we have to edit it, we'll edit it. All right. So we'll do two versions. One is okay. don't step on your own like a dinosaur. Okay. So that's All what right. he actually said. Okay. But the point he wanted to prove is don't get in your own way. The last thing you want to be is an old man sitting there full of regrets for which you have no one but yourself to blame for not taking what seemed like a big risk, for not jumping into the unknown to try and further your opportunities, your experience, your, your mindset, your sense of self, family, religion, whatever the hell it is, it's the last thing you want to do. Because two, two things, that, that great. I think two things about, I mean, what you said is globally, you know, true, but let's, let's go back to cars for a second. <laughs> so, so two things that make me hopeful, right? Uh, like your son, my son, uh, my son's friends, when they turned 16, cared more about this, right, than they did about what they drove. And then something funny happened. They all graduated college, got jobs, like a friend of his got a job in Ogden, Utah, and all of a sudden she had to commute. And, and, and it's very hard to commute in an Uber. Uh, it gets very expensive. So all of a sudden the car became much more central uh, to their like lives. Uh, but but um, probably even more interestingly, if you look at the demographics of this country, uh, you know, people think that the growth is happening in the city. It's not. It's still happening in Orange County, right? In, in, in California, it's happening in the suburbs. And people are actually moving farther and farther away, at least in America. Totally. And well, I think you could argue, right? Not having to go into your cubicle, the COVID eventuality that people now realize how kick-ass Zoom is, all the tools, all the functionality they can do from home, employees and employers are going to see that. I bet you we see more of a post-World War II suburban outskirt lifestyle growth. Yeah, and, and it's, it's not just work. It's like, I remember when I was a kid, right? I, 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 would, I was on the tennis team until my coach said to me, Roman, let's face it, you're no gazelle out there, which is a whole different thing. But, but you know, I would take the that happened to me. I got kicked out of uh, Little League. They're like, it's just not for you, buddy. <laughs> I was Czech, so my parents every at that time, like Lendl and Martina Abertolova were all playing tennis, so I had to play tennis. 
even though I, you know, I'm more of a football player body build. But anyway, uh, you know, we took the late bus to go home from tennis practice. Today, I don't know about your kids, but, you know, if they're into sports, they're traveling not just in the state, but within their region, right? I mean, this is all, this is all much more car-centric than car-based. So, so I, I think uh, that the rumors of the car becoming autonomous and boring, you know, are, are probably um, – early at best. So I, I see a lot of, I see a lot of growth and hopefully potential for cars, and especially, you know, I, right now I'm driving a Tesla Model X because that's kind of the latest car. And I really love driving that car. Not because, um, you know, it, it, it's not because it's um, sexy, but because it, it does like three things I love about cars, right? It's crazy quick, right? When you floor it, that instant torque is really addictive. So I love that about it. I, I actually love the, the, well, Elon calls them uh, falcon wing doors, but it's a cool design. It's, it's bonked my mom on the head like three times and almost sent her to the hospital, but it's still really cool, right? Uh, and I love the fact that it's not, not pulling out the tailpipe. It, it makes, you know, now that we've all been home and our skies have cleared out, I, I really realize just how much shit we're dumping into the atmosphere. And so it really feels good to be driving something that, that is not contributing. And there's, I, I know there's an argument that moving it down the stream and blah, blah, blah. But in general, it's a BS argument. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's cars really cars. a stupid argument unless you like, right. whatever, live in a coal mine town. Right, right. But we're getting away from coal. We're going to renewables. So the energy is becoming much cleaner. And, and, and to me, it just represents the, the potential for what I love, which is off-roading, right? Torque is, off-roading is all about torque, right? And now we've got a, a vehicle that is all electric that has tons of torque. You can change where the, you know, you could, you could take like electric motors and put them in the hubs. You can, you know, you could get really efficient all-wheel drive. And so it's, it's a super exciting time that we're living in. And I want to I wanna be part of that, you know? Wait yeah, and what are you talking about? Wait yeah, that's so cool. Tell, tell, tell me what yeah. you're talking about. So if you if you were to do a torque splitter transmissionless part-time four-wheel drive system, I've always been thrilled with two concepts for that too. Again, from the perspective of an off-road vehicle, not what platform can we share and call off-road capable, but in my world, let's expand on its capability in those environments. So one would be it's pure electric, but we give you room to package in a high KW output Honda Quiet Gen. So you literally have a mobile workshop, home base, research lab, killer camp spot, and the ability to recharge for your range or even potential hybrid scenario. But also, I've always dreamt of a, a basically a potentiometer, because that's what the gas pedals are in these new cars anyway, where you have a constant variable control of your transfer case final drive ratio. So you're at Pismo Beach and you want a Highlander range because it's about stand on top and speed, you spin it high. You want a 110 to one SoCal rock crawling situation, spin that bugger the other way, it'd be so cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, it replaces a Dana 40 or a Dana 60, right? It's, it's, it's that cool, right? You, you, you can do that now. And so I think we're living in, you know, as the Chinese say, interesting times. And I hope that, I hope that the manufacturers, like you said, aren't too committee driven and are ballsy enough to actually, you know, embrace change and then see the potential in it. And I hope it's not just companies like Rivian or Tesla or Lordstown or Bollinger, right, that are driving it. it, it maybe it is GM with the new, because they, they have the technology. It's just lose the committees and, and be brave and, and try something different and, you know, break the mold and, and do something like that. And or hell, buy your company and let you do it. Either you know, either way, it's going to be a win-win for for us who love who love off-roading. Yeah, you know, there's um, it's probably I don't know when if you, since I've already forced you into a mild edit thus far anyway. <laughs> um, there was something that I was I was meaning to bring up before, and then we ADD'd into something else. But um, you're talking of the the experience of you know owning, tinkering, enjoying, but then selling is, you know, part of a collective experience. Just this morning is a beautiful example, but I've often had situations where the, the estate of the deceased or the older gentleman that I bought or woman or whatever, the vehicle that I transform, I love exposing them to the vehicle, either sending them media video photography, if they're not local, just to show them what I did. And in a perfect world, I invite them down to the shop. You got to come drive. Because their yeah. understanding, their depth of 
not only understanding and appreciation of the vehicle as it was for what it is, but then their, their experience of the radical transformation that is our engineering approach is so rewarding. So some guy tracked me down. I talked to him this morning and it turned out, I don't know if you saw that green mercury electric coupe that we built recently. Yep. Um, in fact, we sent it, we flew it over to Geneva, uh, it got invited by Michelin awesome. to be displayed and then they canceled the Geneva auto show and it got stuck in a warehouse for two months. But we just got it back. But anyway, guy calls me, his neighbor, when he was a kid, bought the car brand new from the dealership directly across the street from his place. He yearned for the car. I think the guy said 15 years, 20 years later, that guy sold it to him. He stored it for a while, then went on a road trip and took his 37 Ford flatbed down to pick it up and towed it home, brought it over to the islands in Washington, and he never got to it. He tinkered with it and got it running, and he eventually sold it. And it turns out I actually bought it from the guy he sold it to that never got to tinkering it. In fact, he pulled the drivetrain, and I don't know what happened. It never came to us. But this guy, like, has a, a Super 8 video that he's going to burn onto a disc and send to me of his pulling it out of the barn after a 40-year slumber and of them and their 37 bringing it back up to the Pacific Northwest that he made for his local car club. And I'm like, that is amazing. Like when stuff like that happens, like we, we did a 66 Bronco Roadster derelict that there's just layers of incredible stories within, but like there's, there were pencil drawn maintenance logs, you know, 11, six, nine oil change, five Q, you know, like, in the same handwriting, you know, for decades. So I can't erase that. So that became a part of the design purpose and intent of how we built and why it became a derelict. I've got a picture of a guy in a 10 gallon hat with his big belt buckle and his boots on with his lovely bride under his arm in front of a young oak tree with the Bronco, super proud the day they brought it back to the ranch in 66. Then I have the same tree, but now tree. The same kid, by the way, that was in that first photo. Now a teenager with some young lady. Picture, first date in the Bronco. And then perfect trifecta. I have a picture of him with that same young lady that he then married. Now they're up there in life in front of the same tree that is a behemoth, same Bronco. And like... That's that connection to that history. It's a send to restore and a race, and it's priceless. So cool to have that. Very cool. Well, I, I couldn't think of a better way to end this than on that note because uh, you're right. I mean, cars, uh, I think, and trucks represent um, they're memory makers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they represent the best times in our lives, or sometimes the worst. I actually rolled an M3 into a tree, so it goes both ways, but uh, totally. But here's what's funny, like, I don't know, are you like me in that one of the worst been stranded, I might die car experiences still resulted in me having a love relationship with that particular bucket of poo? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Still love M3s despite that experience? I do. still want one. No, I, I still want one. Yeah, yeah. Even though I had a friend in college, Fred, and he had a TR7, and we were, he left it sitting. I grew up in Chicago and left it sitting at the University of Illinois. And so we got started and drove it home, and all of a sudden we were driving home, and there was this huge clank. And I look, and there's this wheel that comes shooting by. It actually sheared off the bolts, and the wheel came flying off, and we had left you like a divot in the highway from where the disc brake had fallen. Don't you hate that when you're in a car and you see one of your four wheels pass you? Yeah, that's a bad thing. That it's like, yeah. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to us having, uh, you know, that, that – is it? what are you calling that? What are you calling that, the, 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 the Jeep build? Is there a name for it? Have you got a name? You know, it's funny. It's one of the few things we stayed loyal to in that build is we're just calling it Cherokee. 
Okay, the Cherokee Bill. All right, all right, the Cherokee Bill. And by the way, our Comanche, Mark Allen, pointed out that, like you said, uh, it was a Comanche and the model was a pioneer. So it was uh, cowboys and Indians only in America, right? In the same vehicle. Do you know the American Indians now have gotten quite wise with that and no longer allow car companies or any companies to use uh, heritage Indian trademarks uh, without licensing fees? Good for them. Yeah, I'm sure. They're, I'm sure their casinos though are Comanche. This yeah, and, probably yeah. probably a higher priority. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Jonathan. I, we've taken up too much of your time, Andre. I'm sorry if I kind of uh, didn't let you get a word, and I feel bad about that. I just I just um, fell in love with this conversation. So sorry. I I, I, I fell in love watch uh, listening to it. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, and, sorry, and, I talked too much. I'll shut and, up and let you talk more next time. And and for a while I was depressed when you guys were talking about you know the future of autonomy. And then I, at the end I got picked up again because I think customization is key. That's yeah. why trucks and jeeps and maybe even future Broncos are going to be amazing. Is because customization and personalization is great. Hey, we live, you know, new JL, new Defender, new Bronco. You know, we live in incredible times uh, if you're into off-roaders. And I bet, I'm betting that like 50 years from now, somebody, three other guys will be sitting around talking about restoring <laughs> JL. I hope so. <laughs> and, and, I hope they have the platform longevity to make that a viable future. Yeah, order. yeah it's a, that's a good point. They may not. They, they, yeah. they, they, may be, uh, they may be printing the entire vehicle at that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And thank guys, thanks for watching. And remember, check out TFL Car, TFL Truck, TFL Classics, and of course, TFL Now for all your news, views, and real-world reviews. Thank you. Thank you.